All right, welcome back, everybody. This is Mastering JLSL in Touch Designer. My name is Lake Heckman. I'm a new media artist exploring how technology alters human perception and how we can connect with each other as well. Uh, I do this through building interactive installations that I'm fortunate enough to exhibit around the world, including a lot of these works that you see here. And I use a lot of the techniques that I'm going through in this course to generate this work. So I'm happy to share those with everyone as well. This is number 14, Introduction to Simulations 2. Uh, last time we had the very basics of the simulations and made a little particle system uh, as well as a cellular automata system. Today, we're gonna take that a little bit further into more complex systems, uh, some more best practices, and really focus on understanding how to bring it all together because we've covered a lot so far, uh, as you can see. And so I'm excited that we are at this point now, uh, which allows us to really make some, some pretty cool stuff. All right, but before we do that, as I'm sure everyone's aware by now, we got to do a little bit of conceptual work before we get to the fun stuff. So the first thing I want to talk about is a struct. So if you guys are familiar with object-oriented programming, there's the concept of a class where you can kind of define your own uh, data structure that is then used elsewhere in the code base. A struct is a lightweight version of that specifically for GLSL. Um, you can think of it less as object orientation programming or object oriented programming and more as a way to store a multiple values in a single variable, which is really mostly used for keeping code clean and readable. Um, the cool thing is that these structs can uh, be passed as arguments to functions and also can be returned from functions. And so we'll look at some examples of that in a second, but structs are really powerful. And as you can see, you define it like a particle, you give it all of this uh, information, all these attributes, and then as we go through and use our uh, struct in our code, making updates to the particle, we're referencing particle.position, particle.velocity, et cetera. And this just really, really keeps things easy uh, to read, which is kind of a problem uh, once you start getting into programming some more intense simulations. So quick aside, uh, return types from functions. A function in GLSL can return uh, any of the built-in types, like a vec3, a float, an int, et cetera. We can understand what function type uh, or what return type a function is by looking at the declared type uh, in front of the function declaration itself. So this function is going to return a vec4. They can also return structs. So here, this is a function that is returning a particle struct. And then finally, a function can be declared as void, which means it is uh, a function that executes code, but does not actually return a value at all. So those are the three types. And you've seen use cases involving all of these so far, so it shouldn't be too much new. Um, but we are going to look a little bit more deeply into each of these uh, as we build out our best practices. Related uh, argument types to functions. Um, so these are the arguments that we're passing in when we're calling a function. These can also be any type of built-in parameter or a struct, uh, which is great. And the other thing is each uh, parameter has um, is denoted in a specific way that tells the shader a little bit about how that parameter or argument is going to be used. For example, um, you can have an in parameter or an in argument. And an in argument is going to be kind of like your classic argument, right? It takes in a value and the value of that argument is used in the function. That's it. Just exactly how your normal function usage is. Uh, then you have an out, which means that you declare a variable outside of a function, pass it as an argument, and then the results of that, whatever calculations are operating on that variable that you pass as out, 
um, are reflected in an output variable, but not necessarily the input variable. Meaning, um, if you think from a more object-oriented perspective, again, if we're passing a variable by reference, that's kind of like making a copy of it and passing a copy of a variable through. And so any changes to that copy uh, are not actually reflected in the original variable, but instead are reflected in the copy. And then uh, in out is a combination of these two. And the easiest way to think about that is a variable that is passed as an in out argument is going to be operated on in place. Uh, if you're familiar with that concept from Python or other types of object oriented programming. So we have in, we have out, we have in out. Um, all of these are used. I would say the most common is in for sure. And then the one that I use a lot and that we're going to use a lot in this lesson is in out, which is great for simulations. So a really common practice for simulations is to declare a function that's void, that doesn't return anything, and takes in a struct as an in out argument meaning that we take in the struct, we make some changes to that struct, and the changes are saved in the struct after the function is called. Additionally, the function doesn't return anything. So we're basically just operating on our particle in place by using something uh, like this function. All right, so now, now we're getting into what are the best practices when we are programming simulations. Um, this is best practices according to me. It includes what I do myself and what I've learned over the years uh, and taken from others. So call it my best practices, um, but I think they're generally pretty accepted as best practices for readability and code organization. So number one is we want to use a struct for storing and manipulating instance data. That's mostly to improve readability because particle.position makes a lot more sense when you're reading it in code, especially after you come back after a couple months, than um, some random variable called PP, right? Um, so particle that position, particle that velocity, all of that makes a lot of sense. You can see here, kind of in the example, like this update particle function is very clear, right? We're applying an, uh, applying our attractor forces, applying a turbulence force, updating our p dot velocity with our p dot acceleration our p dot position is updated with our p dot velocity etc so that is like i said just very readable and that's why structs are great along the same lines we want to use functions to abstract out complexity from our code to kind of bottle up complex tasks and keep them out of our main function. And we want those functions to be as atomic as possible, meaning they do only one thing so that it's very clear exactly what's being done where. For example, in my update particle screenshot here, apply turb is a pretty obvious function, right? It's obviously applying turbulence to my particle. Um, there's not really much else it could be doing. Right. And so I have an apply attractor function. I have an apply turbulence function, check for dead particles. Uh, all of those are pretty self-explanatory and you can guess what they do even without seeing the code, which is great when you're trying to, uh, like I said, read either somebody else's programming or come back to your own after a period of time. This is all really helpful. Um, so along those lines, having some sort of read and write function uh, to abstract out the reading and writing of data to and from our buffers is very helpful because that lets us really forget about the fact that we're representing all of this data very abstractly as texels and multiple buffers. We have to remember that once or twice when we write our read particle and write particle functions. And then from there on out, we just call particle.velocity, particle.position. And we, we don't need to remember that the scale is the R component of the third input and that lifetime is the G component of that input. Like we don't, we don't care about that. When we're writing our code, we can just say p.scale, p.life, as long as we make sure in our read and write functions uh, that we do understand exactly what's going where. Uh, so that's really nice to keep uh, the mental space clean for writing the actual complex logic. 
I like having an update function that has all of the stuff that's being applied to every instance in our simulation. So the update function is going to hold, you know, apply a tractor, apply turb, update the position, all of that stuff. All of that goes to an update function that gets called once in the main loop, which is great. Uh, heavily using uniforms, always. Um, if statements, they're okay, um, but try and keep them to a minimum. Don't use them where you don't have to. And also, if you are going to use them, uh, keeping them simple is going to be better in the long run, for sure, because complex branching logic can lead to some race conditions or other weird behavior um, as systems scale in complexity. So just be aware of that. And then finally, uh, for loops, while you can use them, just be careful because they can really quickly eat up uh, GPU compute, especially if you start iterating over like every instance in a texture, kind of like uh, what I mentioned at the end of our, our last lesson. So those are all just good things to keep in mind. And I have some examples here. Uh, we're obviously going to get hands on and do all of this ourselves very shortly. And then just a word on debugging. Uh, the ways that I like to debug are using the pixel viewer and the point cloud viewer in Touch Designer using the V or the D keys, respectively, D or V keys, respectively. Um, and then also the GLSL info dat, which gives you any compilers. I'm sure you've noticed that I, I use that as we go through the live examples um, in this course so far. So we'll get some more practice using all of these debugging tools as well. And I believe that wraps it up for our slides. Yeah, so that brings us into the fun stuff again. Um, so here, what are we going to look at? We're going to look at another particle system. I'm going to look at uh, this particle system with oriented boxes and some PBR rendering. And we're also going to look at this strange attractor-based system um, and implement all of these. So we're going to get into all of that in a second. The rest of this video is going to be just for my Patreon subscribers. So if you want to follow along and uh, continue with this course, head over to Patreon, subscribe. You'll get access to the full video for this lesson, all past lessons, all future lessons. You'll get the project files, you'll get the solutions to the exercises, and you'll get access to all of the tutorials that I've made uh, on GLSL, Touch Designer, New Media Art, etc. in the past. So head over there if you are not already subscribed and continue following along. For those of you that are already subscribing, uh, thank you so much. I'm glad that you are getting some value out of this. It is truly my pleasure, and I just don't think I can say thank you enough, so I will say it one more time. It really does mean a lot to me. Thank you. And with that, let's jump into things. So.